This is Gardening in America, and I'm Ed Hume. Today we're in Woodside, California at Filole Gardens, and I'm with Alex Fernandez, the Assistant Garden Superintendent. Where is Woodside, California? Uh, Woodside's a small community about 30 miles drive uh, due south of San Francisco on the peninsula. And we're just off of uh, one of the uh, interstates? Just off of I-280, just oh. about uh, two miles off I-280. Now, the home behind us is? Uh, the home is a 36,000 square foot mansion. It was constructed oh, wow. in, uh, completed in 1917. It took two years to complete. And at that time, uh, William Bourne was the uh, person in the family that uh, commissioned the building and the family that lived in the mansion. Now, I understand there have been some name uh, shows that have taken place here. Would you share a few of those with us? Well, we have had, uh, this is actually the Dynasty House uh, at the beginning of the, the Dynasty TV show. That was filmed here. Um, also, Heaven Can Wait was filmed here. We recent, recently had a couple um, filmed here with Michael Douglas and uh, numerous others, yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, what part of the gardens are we in here? Uh, well, currently we're in the sunken garden. Uh, we've got the sunken pool here, and this is really our biggest display in the springtime. Uh, we've just underplanted with tulips, and in the spring this will be totally low loaded with uh, um, a pale yellow uh, tulip. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how many times a year then do you change the gardens? Uh, depending on the weather, uh, two to three times, uh, usually when we, when we change all of our displays. I see. Now, what's behind us here? The, we've changed directions at the clock and... Yeah, uh, right behind here at the sunken garden and looking up we have the, uh, the clock tower and uh, it's kind of the, one of the main features looking up from this yeah, area. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Beautiful tower. And then out in front of us here kind of is, is uh, a topiary, is that uh, right? Yeah, the swimming pool area with uh, a lot of juniper topiary surrounding it. And, uh, and then as a backdrop, you've got the mountains, the Santa Cruz Mountains as a backdrop for the, for the whole garden. Which, yeah, is really very pretty. And then over to the side here, there's a totally different garden. Uh, on the next side, over in the wall, we've yeah. got the walled garden, which is more of the natural type garden with camellias and rhododendrons and azaleas. Uh, and even that even switches over to a little bit more of a formal garden into the sundial garden area as well. So, and this, so this is only one area of the extensive uh, grounds. Right. Yeah, totally. We have uh, 16 acres of cultivated gardens here, and uh, 13 full-time gardens to, uh, gardeners to manage that. Wow. That's it's absolutely beautiful. Now, on the hedging, what kind of hedges are around this area? Uh, the majority of our smaller hedges you see here are the, uh, tradi the traditional English boxwood. Yes. Uh, and then we also have some of the larger dark uh, green ones are the, uh, um, uh, it's a cross between the English and Japanese yew, or taxis is a botanical sure. name. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alex. If you're ever in the Bay Area, you'll want to be sure to put on your list of places to visit Woodside, California, Fiololi Gardens. There are quite a few plants that offer color in the autumn season, and this is one of them, the beautiful Sasanqua camellia. This is one of my favorite varieties. Notice the upright habit of growth, the dark green foliage, and then down there, look at the flower, single red with yellow stamens. And it flowers during the holiday season. The variety is called Yuletide, really a beautiful single flowering variety. And here's really a very unusual one. This is Snow Flurry. And this one is a winter hardy variety of Sasanqua camellia. Now, Sasanqua camellias will take more weather abuse than most types of camellias. More wind, more rain, more cold weather. But this one will take it down to zero Fahrenheit or even down to 10 degrees below zero. Snow flurry is the variety. It's white, as you can see. And then here's another grape variety. And you can see that camellias can be grown in many different shapes and forms. This is a variety called chansonette and it's really a beautiful pink flowering variety. And look at the dark glossy green foliage on this one as well. Now they do like a little protection from the hot midday sun, especially during the summer months, but you can count on them for beautiful color during the autumn. And then look what we've got here. Well, let me show you the flowers here. That's just breaking bud. This is the improved Myers lemon. This is a patio tropics plant, and it'll take it down to about freezing, but after that time, you want to have it in the house. So you want to have it in the house during the winter, but you know what you're gonna love about it? The fragrance is outstanding. What a nice plant to have in the home during the winter. 
and they're available at your local nursery or garden center. With Thanksgiving just a few days away, there are some great indoor flowering plants that will make nice hostess gifts or beautiful plants to use on the Thanksgiving table. And the chrysanthemums probably are the typical plant for this time of the year. Look at, isn't that beautiful? And look at all these different types and varieties here. There's such a wide selection of chrysanthemums and they really are kind of the typical Thanksgiving plant. Look at also the beautiful rose here. This is a miniature variety and next spring you could plant it out into the garden. So it'd be very attractive at Thanksgiving time too. And here's a plant that's not in flower, but beautiful foliage. And that's one of the Rex begonias. And this is a plant that you could also use either as a hostess gift or on the Thanksgiving table. And the little calanchos are really outstanding plants. They'll still be in bloom at Christmas time, but they come in such a wide variety of colors that they really are super for Thanksgiving or during the holiday season. And the winter flowering azaleas. These are plants also that can be kept over and planted out into the garden next year. But they'll flower for a long period of time. Remember, they require a little bit more watering attention than other plants. So watch the watering very closely. If they want to dry out, it's difficult to get them wet again. And here's a traditional Thanksgiving plant too. And that, of course, is the beautiful Thanksgiving cactus. There are Thanksgiving cactus, Christmas cactus, and Easter cactus. So there are a whole bunch of different types. Uh, give them bright light, but protected from uh, full sunlight. And here's another nice plant that does a good job of purifying the air, cleaning the air in the home. And it comes in a wide variety of colors. It's called, of course, the Gerbera daisies, a beautiful plant for use in the home. And of course, the small African violets come in such a wide range of colors, really makes them very attractive plants to use in the home, particularly in a small area or maybe on a shelf or a bookcase or a similar spot. And in a cool spot, you might consider using the beautiful cyclamens. Uh, they also come in a wide variety of colors and larger flowering plants too. This happens to be one of the miniatures or smaller growing varieties but there are some that are even more miniature than that. Or you could use such plants as the anthurium. And this tropical plant, of course, requires a little bit more protection from the sun. It likes kind of a warm area, but where it doesn't get direct light. And as you can see here, we have shown you just a broad selection of very beautiful flowering plants that not only would be attractive on the Thanksgiving table, but also make excellent hostess gifts. And you'll find these at most of your nurseries, garden centers, and places that sell plants. some great plants that provide interest in color in the home during the winter season. And so let's talk about a few of the hanging type. This is one of them. This is a plant called Nemanthanthus. And you can see it's in flower at this time of the year. But look at the beautiful foliage here. If we look at the underside, we see an entirely different type of foliage. And that's what makes this plant so interesting because, you know, so often you see the hanging basket plants from underneath. This plant, by the way, likes a full bright sunny area. So maybe a south or western exposure would be ideal. Now, here's another plant that's generally grown as a hanging basket plant. But in this particular case, it's been trained upright, hasn't it? This is, of course, the uh, English ivy. and this one, in fact, could be used maybe as an indoor Christmas tree during the holiday season. Just put a few lights on it and a few ornaments. Here's a variegated variety of the English ivy. And I like this because in a dark area, it really stands out, brightens up the whole area. And usually in a hanging basket, we would plant four of these. Now, the English type ivies don't like full bright sunlight in the home. So give them some protection. Bright light would be a good area for them. Here's another nice plant to use in the home. This is the variegated weeping fig. Nice variegation, 
very, very pretty. And again, we'd use four of these plants usually uh, if we're doing up a hanging basket, or we could use them individually on a bookshelf or someplace like that. Give them protection from hot sunlight as well. Nice variegation though. And here, speaking of variegation, this is the prayer plant family, peacock plants they're often called. And look at the number of colors in the foliage. Very attractive and you can see they want to hang out. This plant also will trail down a bit, but don't give it bright light. That's what spots the foliage on it. It needs protection from the hot, bright sun or from any uh, sun exposure at all. And of course, one of the most popular of all hanging plants are the ferns. A whole bunch of different varieties. This happens to be the Boston fern. Now we learn, don't we, about ferns from their natural growing habits. Outdoors, they grow in an area where it's shady and where it's usually cool and where it's a little bit on the moist side. Duplicate those conditions indoors and you'll have a lot of success in growing the ferns. And then last but not least, of course, the Christmas cactus another great hanging plant to use in the home. And uh, they flower for quite a long period of time, but very subject to light exposure. Great plants, some of them that you can consider as hanging plants in your home this winter. It's not too late to plant out those spring flowering tulips, daffodils, hyacinths, crocus. Any of the spring flowering bulbs can go into the garden now. In fact, you know, you may be able to buy them at your local nursery or garden center or garden outlet at a reduced price at this time of the year. In fact, I plan to plant about a thousand here in the garden because the prices are so good. Now, Keep in mind one important thing. When you plant bulbs, you want to plant them three times the greatest diameter of the bulb. And that would be the distance between the thumb and my forefinger. In other words, oh, let's say two inches. So three times that would be six inches deep. Three times the greatest diameter of the bulb. And this is a tulip, by the way. So now I'm going to add to this planting hole, which I've already dug, a little bit of soil dust. And I'll also add, oh, a teaspoon or two of, or a tablespoon, I should say, or two of a bulb fertilizer. And I'm going to add also a little bit of organic humus here to the planting soil. And then I'm ready to plant the bulbs. And is what I'll do is plant them upright, of course, the pointed end up. And into each planting hole, you can get quite a few bulbs, as you can see. In fact, in this one, I'm going to get close to a dozen bulbs. So that means when they come in bloom, Myrna can come out here and pick a couple of the flowers and it's not going to ruin the display in any way. So there we have, I think that's a dozen bulbs and they're not touching each other because if they touch each other and one of them is diseased, of course it'll spread the disease to the others. Now all we'll do then is to pull the soil in over the top. Simple as that. Now let's take a look at planting daffodils. This is a single nose bulb, by the way, and will produce one flower, Daffodils Narcissus jonquils. And that's what's called in the trade a nose. And, oops, I've got the, the fertilizer there, put in a little bit of soil dust, and then a little bit of organic humus and mix them together. And again, I'll set the pointed end up, and this is a triple nose bulb, so that means this is going to produce two flowers. In other words, it's several bulbs together. Again, being careful that they do not touch each other. That's the critical factor. And again, we'll just set them in like so. Now, these can be easily planted at this time of the year, as long as the ground is not frozen. That's the critical point. And all we need to do after we've done that is simply pull in the surface soil. And then if we wanted to, over this top soil here, we could plant some of the winter flowering pansies to provide color for us throughout the winter season. And that would be really an excellent idea. But right now, a great time to plant out those spring flowering bulbs.
I'm here in the backyard of our new place and I want to share with you a few ideas. This lower area could be used as a badminton court or a croquet court. And if you do that, then I think I'd have a straight bed all the way across here. And why put a bed in at all? The important thing is the small children coming down here, the edge of the rock, you know, then they're into the lake. So if we have a barrier of a bed and I'll berm it or build it up, that'll make all the difference in the world. But because I'm not really interested in a badminton court or a croquet court, I'm going to give the beds a little bit more of a design. And I'll come out and you use the garden hose for this purpose. And then come in a little bit more like this. That's pretty close. And you can straighten this out until you get the exact design that you want. Okay, very simple. Then down here on the end is what I'll do because of the fence and it's not too attractive. We'll kind of soften it with the right kinds of shrubs. By the way, we'll also use low shrubs and you'll see this in the next few weeks across here as the barrier between the beds and the actual lake itself. Now back in here, I've got another idea and that is I want to do away with the lawn here. This is not an easy area to mow at all. So is what I'll do is take the lawn out and make a nice free flow path up through the center here. And that'll look really attractive. We can do some interesting planting around it. And then down here at the base is what I'm going to do is once again give this bed a little freeform styling, like about so maybe. And I'll put in a permanent retaining wall here. And again, to soften it, the retaining wall, get rid of these rocks completely and um, make it a more maybe formalized uh, retaining wall and get rid of most of these plants, although they will be used in other parts of the garden. We'll recycle them and use them somewhere else. In front of the wall, I'll have a bed area so that again, I can soften the wall a little bit with the proper types of plant material. But the hose is a great way to outline your beds and get started. Then the next thing you do, and the thing that I will be doing next, in fact, is to get a straight edge sh shovel or a half moon edger, either one. And I'll go right along the edge of the hose and actually cut out the beds. You know, it's a real simple process, but you'll be amazed at how different this will look the next time you see it. It's going to give you much more of the fundamentals or kind of a bird's eye view of what can happen with a little bit of planning. Woodside, California, Filoli Gardens, and I'm with Alex Fernandez, the assistant garden superintendent here at the gardens. What does Filoli mean? Well, Filoli goes back to uh, William Bourne. His motto was, fight for a just cause, love your fellow man, and live a good life. So from the first two letters of fight, love, live, you came up with Filoli. Oh, I was wondering, I've always wondered what that meant. Right. What part of the gardens are we in here? Uh, currently, we have in the background, we have the garden house, which is a great spot to sit a, a nice and a real hot afternoon here. Uh, it stays really cool. It's a beautiful little resting spot in the garden. Uh, it, as far as in the garden itself, we're within the walled garden right now, which is divided into the sunken garden, the Dutch garden, and then we have the garden house lawn area in through here. I notice you have a rose area as well. Yeah, we have a fairly extensive uh, rose garden. Uh, the entire gardens, the 16 acres, are divided into uh, different garden rooms, and within each room, uh, we have a different, basically a different theme within that garden room. And you've got a lot of water features here. Many water features, a lot of uh, sunken pools, mostly used for their uh, reflective capabilities. Oh, I was yeah. wondering, and, and lots of beautiful plants all the way around as well. Tell us now, uh, is the garden open all year long? Uh, the garden is open from uh, mid-February through about the early November, so uh, probably the nicest time of year to come as far as if you like a lot of color uh, in from April through May is when we have a lot of the wisteria going, the tulip bulbs are all up and in flower, and then the rose garden really starts to take into effect uh, towards uh, May and through June and takes us through the rest of the summer. 
Now we're in, he, here on a beautiful day in November, but I was noticing that they're promoting some Christmas features too here. Uh, we have a we have a fairly large uh, Christmas event that we put on here. It was a week long event where we uh, sell uh, quite a bit of merchandise. We decorate the entire mansion uh, with uh, 18 foot uh, white furs, uh, and totally decorated lights and you name it. It's uh, quite quite a sight. And you got a beautiful uh, uh, gift shop here too, don't you? Very nice gift shop with uh, all types of souvenirs for people. To take home yes you know Filoli is such an interesting and beautiful place and I'm sure our homeowners would and viewers would like to know how many people does it take to maintain this place uh, we have 13 full-time staff uh, just in the garden department to maintain the garden on top of that we have an internship program where we can have as many as uh, five interns at a time um, and then we also have roughly about 70 garden volunteers that help out as well Oh my gosh. Yeah. You have docents then that take tours during the seasons? Exactly. We have uh, docent-led tours Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays, and uh, uh, self-guided tours on Fridays and Saturdays. Is there an admission fee to the garden? Uh, yes, there is a fee. Okay, so you can count on that. Beautiful place to visit, and not very far from San Francisco. Nope, not far at all. It's about a 30-minute drive. Alex, we've really enjoyed the garden. Thank you for sharing them with us. And what a great place to get some gardening ideas. That's all the time we have today. Hope you can join us again next time for Gardening in America. And remember, our relationship with the planet today is tomorrow's future. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.